So good morning, everyone. It's a very proud moment for me. My grandson reading scripture. Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, yeah, so this morning we're going to be into the uh, first psalm. Now, one of the things about preaching this psalm, it's kind of uh, interesting that it's uh, positive and negative at the same time. It's talking about some negative things without which the godly man is blessed. So we'll start out this morning, as usual, uh, with our uh, thesis. So to be blessed means fundamentally to be approved or to find approval. The idea that is expressed in the Hebrew is really graphic, and it says how happy or all the happiness many times over is the man, and then we go on, on from there. So the cause of this abundance of happiness <clears throat> And you need to think about this as we go into the lesson. The cause of this abundance of happiness is the purity of a righteous walk with God. How happy, many times over, is that person who walks with God? There can be no higher blessing than to be approved of God. I think of Hebrews 11, a passage that's always stuck with me. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. And so that's the highest blessing, the highest honor that a person can ever have is to be approved of God. And so the company that we keep and the choices that we make determine whether or not we are among the blessed. So this is what we want to examine this morning as we continue to grow our roots deep into the soil and strong to stand and withstand all of the storms that life may bring to us. So we're going to be talking from this subject, a tree, or like a tree, firmly planted. Now, in a recent sermon, we asked the question, who are you listening to? In a very recent sermon, we asked the question, in whom or in what have we placed our hope? Today, <clears throat> we want to ask the question, whose blessing is it that we diligently seek? Now, if the approval of God is more important to us, if the blessing of God is more important to us than the approval of our family, no matter how cherished, or of our contemporaries, no matter how influential, then certainly we are amongst the blessed. And so as we go into this, first verse of Psalm 1, the psalmist is going to begin by painting a picture, if you will, of the character and the condition of the blessed person. Now, the Lord knows those who are his by name. He knows every single person who belongs to him. But we only know the people of God, including ourselves, by character. 
The good man in Psalm 1-1 is seen in the company he chooses to keep and the standards by which he consequently and consistently lives his life. And so what we're going to be doing as we break this down a little bit is to see that the psalmist is going to be describing the blessed man in terms of negative. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. This individual does not choose to listen to the wicked. So it's really more, there's really more to it than that. And so let's take a look and consider this paraphrase, if you would. Oh, the happiness many times over of the one who does not casually go through the motions or imitate the plan of life of those who live in ungodliness. So the idea of walking, not to not walk in the counsel of the wicked, the idea of walking is uh, passing by or going casually through the motions from one point to the next. And it carries the idea of one who does not imitate or casually go through the motions of wickedness. Not walking in that kind of counsel. And so we could say, blessed is the man who is not in the state of mind cherished by the wicked. The immoral is what wickedness really points to. So you think about the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 17. Just think about what he says here in light of this. This I say, therefore, and affirm together with the Lord. So Paul and the Lord are talking to us. That you walk no longer in the flesh, that you walk. Let me turn over here because I'm messing it up a little bit. That you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk. In the futility of their mind. This is very much a mind thing. Not cherishing the state of mind or walking in the state of mind cherished by the wicked. That you walk no longer. As the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And so here is a walking, and what is it is it based on? And they having become callous have given themselves over the practice of sensuality okay, and, uh, and all kinds of, of filthiness with greediness, but you have did not learn Christ in this way. You did not learn Christ. So we can learn from the ungodly or we can learn from Christ. And so just as truth is in Jesus, and then he talks about putting away the old self and being renewed in the spirit of your mind and putting on the new self, which in the image of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. If I cherish the state of mind of the ungodly, then I'm going to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. And so after Paul 
tells us about renewing our mind and not walking as the Gentiles also walk as a result of that renewing of our mind, then he goes on to demonstrate or to illustrate once again that Inward is primary, outward is secondary, because he goes on to say now, speak truth to one another. Uh, don't practice bad anger that causes you to sin. Work with your hands so that you may provide for yourself and your family and have something to share with others instead of stealing. Uh, use words that help and not harm. Be tender hearted toward one another, forgive one another as Christ has forgiven you. This is what it looks like to depart from evil. So he's talked about walking as the Gentiles also walk and describe that. But then after that renewing of the mind, he says, now this is how you live. And this is how uh, you walk. Uh, in this in this world, this is departing from evil. You know, in in Proverbs chapter two, I believe in verse seven, the beginning of wisdom, he says, is acquire wisdom. And with all your acquiring, get understanding. And then Job twenty eight twenty along with that very well. And to man, he said. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. So get wisdom, learn what to do, to put it simply. But now that you know what to do, do it. <laughs> and that shows understanding, to depart from evil is understanding. So the person knows and they act, and, uh, and that's really, really what it's all about. And so the ungodly person that the writer is talking about has no goal. Everything is about immediate gratification. Not looking for the pie in the sky by and by. I want to get mine now. <laughs> That's the counsel, part of the counsel of the wicked, to be sure. They have no certain rule that they live by and are at the beck and call of every temptation. But think about what David wrote in the 101st Psalm. Beautiful words and very strong and very pointed. He says, I will sing of loving kindness and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praises. I will give heed to the blameless way. When will you come to me? I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. I will place no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It will not fasten its grip on me. A perverse heart will depart from me. I will know no evil. Very strong, determined words. I will, I will not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. You can read the rest of that psalm. He's very, 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 very strong in his stance about who he's going to listen to and who he's going to keep company with. Thorns and snares are in the way of the, of the wicked. But he who guards himself is far from them. That's where to be, far from them. So if I'm going to walk in the counsel of the wicked, then I've got to I've got to put up with those thorns and snares 
And we see those things manifested around us all the time. The Lord says, I will teach you and instruct you in the 32nd Psalm in the way you should go. I will counsel you. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. And sometimes we lament that we didn't have parents, for instance, who gave us spiritual guidance early in our life and we've had to, you know, <laughs> fall and bust our head on the rocks and skin our knees and, and uh, wonder if we're ever going to make it. But then we do have a father who says, hey, I'll teach you, instruct you, I'll guide you. We don't need to listen to the counsel of the wicked. We have a heavenly father who says, I remember who he was talking to in Psalm 32. That was David. And so the godly man does not walk in the counsel of of the wicked. He does not stand in the path of sinners. This is a determination. So if we make a choice to walk in the counsel of the wicked, then we can find ourselves, as we'll see in a moment, on another level, which I'm going to call determination. And this is, a, this is a downward spiral. This word stand comes from, it, the, the idea of stand comes from a word meaning a path, a certain and precise way of life. So we have the casual passerby Imitating the casual movements of wickedness slows down. So if you decide to walk in the counsel of the wicked and you are a Christian and you've been going along and, and uh, walking along with God and you start listening to the counsel of the wicked, spiritually you start to slow down. You're just walking along and and before you know it, you take your stand. As one writer put it, has given themselves over to the power and practice of sin, of wickedness. Psalm 35, the transgression speaks to the wicked in their heart. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So forget about wisdom. Forget about understanding. If the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and with that wisdom we need understanding, now that's all out the window. And we're listening to the wrong people, <clears throat> and spiritually we're slowing down, and we're going to take a stand. And so in the case of this individual, their sins of omission make way for sins of commission, because now we're, we're stopped. And we're not doing what we need to be doing. We're not walking with God. We're not, you know, et cetera. And we're omitting. We're not serving. And when we stop serving God, we start serving Satan. There isn't any limbo place in the, in the middle. I can ride this out. The eyes 
or the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he watches all his paths. His own transgressions will capture the wicked, and he will be held by the cords of his sin. He will die for lack, listen, of instruction. And in the greatness of his folly, he will go astray. The godly man knows that. And so we do not walk in the counsel of the wicked nor stand on the paths of sinners. And he does not sit in the seat of the scornful. You get to this point, you're in real trouble. You've slowed down because you've chosen to listen to the wrong people. You're determined to stand there. Because you've come to you've come to a standstill, is the idea. You've slowed to a standstill. If you sit in the seat of the scornful, I don't know if you've ever experienced the scornful. People who will raise their face to the sky and curse God. whenever you bring up God and his word and tell you how much of a stupid fairy tale that is. When it comes to the scornful, scoffers are people who reject, despise, and all remedies to their condition and they make a mockery of sin and of God's warnings about the end result of a life lived practicing lawlessness. They're in open rebellion against God. Now, look. The ungodly may be rich may be friendly. But blessed is the man who does not walk in their counsel, stand in their path, or sit in their seat. Scoffers might be brilliant people in many ways. If you're sitting in the seat of scoffers, you're in trouble. You know, sitting carries the idea of settling, settling down. I, I picture myself going into my office and sitting in my recliner, settling down. Uh, and it's even made clearer by the use of the word seat, which means a dwelling or a habitation. You know, Olympia is the seat of government in Washington. The heart is the seat of our affections. And so that idea is even clearer when we see it from that standpoint, that we sit that's where we are, and when people are at that point, there's not a whole lot of remedy because they mock any remedy for their condition. It's a bad place to be. So, the Lord has gone through great pains, or went through great pains, to try to restore Israel when he walked this earth. But you know, we've been talking about what the godly man does not do. But I want to 
bring a warning to our attention. And you remember in the book of Matthew, the unclean spirit that was cast out of the man and he, he went through waterless places, desert places, looking for a home, didn't find any. But this person had been uh, swept clean. Everything was in order. So here was the nation of Israel that God had provided everything for. Everything was, was there for the taking. And that nation is represented by this man from whom these, this demon was uh, cast out, but found seven others more wicked than himself, uh, a group of them came back, and the, the last state of that man was worse than the first. And so this is the danger of negative righteousness, as I call it. The Jewish people had rejected God's servant. They crucified God's son. But let's visit the Pharisee and the publican, the tax collector, for a moment. So Jesus, you know, he told this parable in Luke 18 to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Just in, that, just in that statement right there. And so they go up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector, and the Pharisee stood and was praying this to, him, to himself, God, I'm glad I'm not like other people. I mean, aren't you glad you're not like, you know, people out here messing up, robbing people and messing up downtown. Don't, aren't you glad you're not like them? Ain't nobody. <laughs> I'm good. Other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax guy. Says, but the tax collector was stood some distance away and was unwilling even to lift his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And Jesus, through this parable, made it known to those who were trusting in themselves that they were righteous, that that man, that tax collector, went to his house justified rather than the other. Why? For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. So yeah, they rejected God's servant. They crucified his son. And God delivered their temple, their capital, their nation over to the Romans and many thousands to destruction. Why, the Lord asked, do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Walking in the wrong counsel, standing in the wrong path, and boy, were they resolved to get rid of Jesus. You see what the psalmist had in mind in Psalm 1 1 was the spiritual erosion these word pictures illustrate to us how easy it is to be from righteousness and 
walked on the very wrong path. And so, having read Psalm 1 1, the man went up to the temple to pray, got, got the priest and got busy. We've seen what the righteous man does not do. And now we await further instructions as to how we live our lives. And that begins in verse 2. In fact, I wrote a sermon about it. Want to hear it? Come back next week. And we'll look at now at the things that the righteous man does do as we continue to grow our roots deep into the spiritual soil that God has given us, our minds, his word, and he wants us to be strong and stand for him. So let's see what the righteous man does in that regard.